throughout U.S. history, the United States has always tried to remain neutral. This has been true since Washington's farewell address in the 1790s, and it's true right up to and including World War II. It's not until after World War II that the United States takes a bigger role in the global scene. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, there was a big problem with the rise of fascists. And the big reason for that was bitter feelings after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles negotiations in particular. After World War I, the U.S. returns to a policy of isolationism and neutrality. This really explains the U.S. Senate rejecting the Treaty of Versailles, particularly the League of Nations. To them, the League of Nations sounded like an alliance system, and alliances are exactly what had caused World War I. So the United States Senate wanted to avoid the United States being dragged into future conflicts, which is their big reason for resisting both Versailles and the League of Nations. However, at the same time, the bitter feelings left over from World War I lead to the rise of Hitler in Germany. Mussolini is at the same time coming to power in Italy, and Japan is beginning to expand its influence in the Pacific. And this is all going on throughout the 1920s and 30s, while the United States is really just remaining isolationist and minding its own business. Some say that's the way to go. Others say that had the United States taken notice sooner, World War II might not have been as bad as it was. The large picture on the left, you can see a photo of Benito Mussolini. Upper right, you should be familiar with Adolf Hitler. Bottom right is Emperor Hirohito of Japan. The Neutrality Acts. In both 1935 and 1937, there are laws passed specifying that the United States was going to remain neutral in the growing conflict in Europe. These acts specified that no sale or shipment of military arms or goods would be going on with belligerent nations, and that just means nations involved in war. No loans or credits would be given to belligerent nations. It called for a cease of travel by U.S. citizens on the ships of any belligerent nations, and any non-military goods purchased by belligerent nations were to be paid for on a cash-and-carry basis. That means you have to pay in cash, and you have to transport it yourself. The Spanish Civil War throughout the late 1930s. Francisco Franco, also a fascist, tries to overthrow the democratically elected government of Spain beginning in 1936. Franco and his followers are receiving aid from Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy because he is a fellow fascist. Defenders of the Spanish government that had been democratically elected received aid from the Soviet Union because they were mainly socialists. The U.S., Britain, and France refused to get involved because they didn't like fascism or socialism. Spanish does fall to Franco's fascist government in 1939, and although Spain remained neutral during World War II, they were major sympathizers with the Axis powers. There's actually a good story of a secret mission during World War II called Operation Mincemeat. There's a good book written about it. There's an old Hollywood movie called The Man Who Never Was that is about Operation Mincemeat. And the story goes that because of Spain's loyalty to Nazi Germany, information about an Allied invasion of Europe was dropped with a body off the coast of Spain, knowing that when the Spanish found it, it would be turned over to the Nazis. Now, the information contained on the body claimed that the Allies were going to invade Greece. And the Nazis definitely took the bait because they sent a ton of resources into Greece to try to thwart an Allied invasion. What ended up happening is that the Allies invade Sicily and all of the boot of Italy, and the Nazis weren't really prepared for it due to the fact that they had taken the bait of Operation Mincemeat and reinforced Greece rather than Italy. So Spain does kind of come into play during the war, and due to Operation Mincemeat, it actually works in the Allies' favor. Here's a photo of Hitler meeting with and shaking the hands of Francisco Franco in Spain. The Axis powers are expanding militarily throughout the 1930s, and it gets scarier and scarier as the decade carries on. Japan invades Manchuria in 1931 and China in 1937. Italy invades Ethiopia in 1935. And Germany is occupying all sorts of lands in Europe. The Rhineland in France and Belgium is a specific example. And they claim that it's all German territory that had been taken away in the Treaty of Versailles negotiations. 
FDR gives a speech in 1937 that ends up being called the Quarantine Speech. In this speech, he encourages the U.S. and other nations to scale back or cut off trade with aggressor nations like Germany, Italy, and Japan. He's criticized by isolationists who say that his words could end up dragging the U.S. into a conflict and that he really should have just stayed neutral even in the way he was speaking. Here's a map showing the expansion of the Japanese Empire, and this is at its height in 1942. So this is even after the war started. But some of the areas that I just mentioned that Japan was invading at the time were Manchuria here and parts of China here. Mussolini invades Ethiopia. You can see what part of Africa that is on this map here. And this is a map of Nazi Germany's expansion throughout Europe. The Rhineland is taken from France and Belgium. This is a major, major source of controversy after the Treaty of Versailles, and Hitler makes it one of his first targets when expanding. They expand into Austria, which Hitler believes is rightfully German. And eventually, he even moves into this bright red territory of the Sudetenland here. At the Munich Conference in 1938, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain actually gives in to Hitler to try to avoid war. Hitler had annexed the Sudetenland that I just showed on the map before, which was even more territory in Czechoslovakia than he had already taken over. To avoid armed conflict, Chamberlain reaches the agreement as long as Germany promises to stop their expansionist policies there. Only a few months after the Munich Conference, however, German troops occupied the rest of Czechoslovakia and even threatened to invade Poland. This shows that, in this instance, appeasement had been a major failure. Here is Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain meeting in the shaking the hands of Hitler and returning here to Britain proudly with Hitler's signature on the Munich Agreement. He believed he had avoided war at this point. He was immediately drummed out of office after the invasion of Poland comes about, and Winston Churchill comes to power as Prime Minister. And the reason he is chosen is because he was one of the few people in the British government warning about the dangers of Hitler throughout the 1930s. He was a member of the House of Commons, and he would regularly give speeches on the floor of the House of Commons talking about how dangerous Hitler's Germany was. So when that proved to be true, he was the logical replacement for Neville Chamberlain as British Prime Minister. So Germany does invade Poland in 1939. Britain and France are no longer able to just sit idly by, so they both declare war on Germany. At the same time that this is going on, Winston Churchill has a growing number of people calling for him to be the new Prime Minister. The Soviet Union refuses to ally with Britain or France because just before the war, Hitler and the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin had reached the Nazi-Soviet Pact, which is really just a non-aggression treaty. What they really did not tell anyone is that they had essentially secretly agreed to split Poland. As Germany was invading from the west, so was the Soviet Union invading from the east, and Poland never stood a chance. They essentially shared Polish territory as part of the agreement not to fight each other. Poland surrenders to German forces in 30 days after the German tank divisions carried out what's called a Blitzkrieg, which in German is just called lightning attack. And this is really just a new Napoleonic slashing tactic using tanks that would swiftly defeat your enemy. French forces lasted even less time, and France was occupied by Germany in 1940. Here are the attacks of Germany on Poland, and like I said, at the same time that Germany is attacking from the west, the Soviet Union is attacking from the east, so Poland really never stood a chance. And then here you can see the German invasions of France, which was really a multi-pronged approach, and again using these blitzkrieg tactics with panzer tanks. One more Neutrality Act in 1939 changed some of the policies from the previous Neutrality Acts. The previous Act said that the U.S. could sell non-military goods on a cash-and-carry basis to belligerent nations. FDR convinced Congress in 1939 to allow military goods to also be sold on a cash-and-carry basis. The U.S., however, only sold military goods to Britain and France, refusing to sell them to the Axis powers. Soon, even non-military goods are cut off to Germany, Italy, and Japan. This is a major, major reason that the Japanese decide to attack Pearl Harbor and bring the United States into the war. 
once the United States had cut off trade with Japan, Japan was going to be unable to continue its war effort, mainly due to oil reserves that they were dependent on trading with the United States for. The Destroyers for Bases and Lend-Lease Acts really brought the United States on the verge of just outright joining the war. The Destroyers for Bases deal in 1940 said that the U.S. would give 50 destroyers, which are really just anti-submarine ships, to the British in exchange for eight British naval and air bases extending from Newfoundland in Canada to British Guiana in South America. The Lend-Lease Act followed up in 1941, and FDR really convinced Congress to pass this because he said that the cash-and-carry policy was not giving Britain enough military goods to continue to fend off Nazi Germany. This agreement allowed Britain to borrow, or lease, war supplies. This officially ends U.S. neutrality. FDR continues to give speeches and argue that the United States needed to act as the arsenal of democracy. This is a term that he uses repeatedly in speeches, the arsenal of democracy. The Atlantic Charter is agreed upon by Britain and the United States in August 1941. A battleship anchored off the coast of Canada served as the meeting place for FDR and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. At the meeting, the two leaders agreed to the war goals, and this is what comes to be known as the Atlantic Charter. All nations deserve the right to self-determination, and this just means that the people of any nation really deserve a democratically elected government. U.S. and Britain would not gain any territory from the war. Aggressor nations must be disarmed, and there must be a permanent system of general security in the future. This ends up becoming NATO and the U.N. They still exist today. We'll talk much more about that in our next unit of study after covering World War II. Here is a photo of FDR and Winston Churchill meeting to agree upon the Atlantic Charter. This is the end of the presentation. Please make sure that you go back and take the online quiz associated with these notes. Use your notes. If you use your notes, there's really no reason why you can't get a perfect score. Thank you. See you in class.